I'm going to be telling you the story of a haunted house, better known today as the Sally House. The Sally House is located in Kansas, and it is said to be one of the most haunted houses in history and is still haunted to this day. So, now that you know that, I will get right into the story. The house was built in the 1800s. It was white, two stories, three bedrooms, and perfect for a small family. Deborah and Tony Pickman moved into this house in 1992. They were so excited to finally own a house, especially due to the fact that Deborah was pregnant with their first child. Right as they moved in, they quickly made one of the upstairs bedrooms into a nursery. They noticed right away that lights would flicker, the phone would ring and no one would be there, timers would go off. But once their son was born, way more things started to happen. They came home one night and went upstairs to put their son to bed. When they walked into the room, they see that all of his stuffed animals have been placed in a circle, facing each other. Every single stuffed animal's hands were touching. Stay tuned for part two. This is part two of the true story of one of the most actively haunted houses in America, known as the Sally House. Deborah and Tony Pickman walked into their baby boy's room to see all of his stuffed animals had been placed into a circle facing each other. All of their hands were touching. Deborah was just convinced that someone was messing with them. The couple put the stuffed animals back on the shelf and turned the light off in the nursery. They walked downstairs and a couple minutes later, they realized the light in the nursery had been turned back on. They searched the entire house and found no one. Deborah and Tony Pigman then called the family that used to live in the house. They asked the family if anything like this had ever happened to them. The family said that their children's toys would always be laying on the floor. When they would ask the children to pick it up, the children would always blame it on their friend named Sally. The parents just thought that Sally was one of their imaginary friends. Things start to get even more weird when the Pickmans contact a psychic named Barbara. Barbara can sense things in the house without even being there. Stay tuned for part three. This is part three of the true story of one of the most actively haunted houses in America, known as the Sally House. Deborah and Tony Pickman got in contact with a psychic in California named Barbara. She can sense things in the house without even being there. Barbara says the Pickmans have a ghost. It is a girl between the ages of 5 and 13, and her name is Sally. The same name the family who lived there before said that their kid's imaginary friend was named. Barbara says that Sally likes them, but they need to make rules for Sally, because she's a child. Tony's brother George comes over later that night, and Tony takes a picture. Right as he took the picture, the bear in the corner of the room turns around. George got super freaked out, so he tried to move, but he was stuck. A presence was holding him back from moving. They were so freaked out that they grabbed Deborah and the baby and tried to leave the house. As Tony was almost in the car, something stinks his back so hard that he let out a painful cry. Tony checks his back and there were three long bloody scratch marks. Stay tuned for part four. This is part four of the true story of one of the most actively haunted houses in America, known as the Sally House. After being spooked and running out to the car, Tony picked up his shirt and saw three long bloody scratch marks on his back. Deborah calls the psychic Barbara back and asks if the ghost is actually friendly. Barbara thinks it is best for her just to come and see for herself. When Barbara gets there three days later, she can actually see Sally the ghost. She says, Sally's just a little girl. She's nice. She doesn't want to hurt you. But Barbara does say that Sally doesn't like men. Barbara says the scratches on the back of Tony's back is because Sally was just excited. The Pickmans just have to tell Sally that that is not okay. Deborah Pickman starts to feel a motherly love towards the ghost. Deborah talks to the ghost Sally. She buys toys for her. She even plays with her. One day, Deborah decided to buy Sally a doll. She gift wrapped it and put it in the nursery. Stay tuned for part five. This is part five of the true story of one of the most actively haunted houses in America, known as the Sally House. Deborah Pickman started to feel a motherly love towards Sally the ghost. She bought her a doll, she gift wrapped it, and put it in the corner of the nursery. A couple of days later, she sees the doll she bought for Sally laying in the center of the baby's crib. The weird thing is though, the box that she put the doll in and wrapped so perfectly was still intact in the corner of the room. Not a single piece of wrapping paper was taken off. Deborah loves what Sally can do. But Tony Pickman, on the other hand, does not like what Sally does. He hears scratching coming from inside the walls. He hears scary voices. Tony says that the voices sound like a whole bunch of people, not just one. One night, Tony comes home and sees Sally standing there in the kitchen. 
Neither of the Pikmins have ever actually seen Sally. They have just heard voices and felt her. But soon after, she disappears. Stay tuned for part six. This is part six of the true story of one of the most actively haunted houses in America, known as the Sally House. Just for reference, Tony and Deborah Pickman and their baby are the ones who live in the house. Sally is the ghost of the house. Tony comes home from work and sees Sally standing there in the kitchen. None of them have actually ever seen Sally, but Sally was standing there in an old white dress. Just a couple seconds later though, she disappears. Tony doesn't believe that this is just a little girl. He thinks it is more sinister than that. A couple months later, the Pickmans invited some friends over for dinner. As they were sitting in their living room, something scratches Tony's forehead so hard that it draws blood. Everyone watched the scratch go across his forehead, but no one saw what caused it. That same night, Tony had a dream that someone dragged him out of bed by the wrists. He woke up the next morning to bruises and blisters on his wrists in the form of child fingerprints. The family takes Christmas photos and sees a large eerie figure in the photo. But it's not Sally. Stay tuned for part 7. This is part 7 to the true story of one of the most actively haunted houses in America known as the Sally House. For reference, Tony and Deborah Pickman are the people who live in the house with their baby. Sally is the ghost of the house. The Pickmans take their Christmas photos and there's a large eerie figure in one of the photos. But it's not Sally. They send it to a psychic and the psychic says the person in the photo is an old woman. Tony was taking a nap one day when dust particles started to come together and form the shape of an old lady. The door slammed shut and everything in the room started to shake. It looked like the woman was about to strangle him. He crawls out of the bed towards the door, but the door won't open. But Deborah didn't even hear a thing from downstairs. A television show that specializes in ghost sightings hears about the Pikmins and wants to come to their house. The producers got there and they started filming right away. The first day of filming, something attacked Tony and left three large scratch marks in his arm. Tony was attacked a total of 11 times on just the first day of filming. Stay tuned for part 8. This is part 8 of the true story of one of the most actively haunted houses in America known as the Sally House. For reference, Tony and Deborah Pickman and their baby live in the house. Sally is the ghost of the house. After the producers of the show left, the Pickmans felt hopeless. They felt like nothing else was going to work. They finally get in contact with a medium who said that they would come and cleanse the house. The median said that there was a little girl named Sally in the house, an old angry woman, and an old man. The medium asked the Pigmans if they wanted any of the ghosts to stay before she cleansed it. Deborah wanted Sally to stay, but the cleansing of the house didn't work. It honestly just made the spirits more angry. Tony kept hearing voices that told him to kill his wife, the baby, set the house on fire, things like that. The voices finally convinced Tony to kill a cat. But Tony doesn't even remember killing the cat. The Pickmans finally moved out two weeks later. Today, Atchison, Kansas rents out the house for tours. Thank you for listening. I'm going to be telling you the scary story of the house I lived in in elementary and middle school. It was a three-bedroom house, one bedroom in the basement, and two bedrooms upstairs. Because I was the oldest, I got put in the bedroom in the basement. Right when we moved in, I already had creepy feelings about the house. I hated being downstairs by myself. One day I dropped a $20 bill behind my dresser. I decided to move my dresser all by myself and behind the dresser was this door. It wasn't a normal door, it was really short and just squared. It was also glued off so I couldn't get into it. Me and my neighbor who were best friends worked at it for days to get into it. We finally got it open and inside was another room. It was almost like an underground attic. The walls were wooden, the ceiling was wooden, there was no carpet but it smelt awful. My parents found out and they were super mad at me for opening the room. They of course put that dresser in front of that door for a reason because they knew I would explore it. But after that, things started to get weird. Stay tuned for part two. This is part two of my scary childhood story about the door behind my dresser. Of course, my parents were really mad at us for opening it up, so they sealed it back up. They just didn't want us to get hurt from all the rusty nails or if there was mold inside. But I think we released something when we opened that door and a lot of things started to happen. First, I started having night terrors to the point where I would scream at the top of my lungs and not wake up. My parents would have to come downstairs and wake me up and put me back to bed. Then, every single night I would have this reoccurring dream that me, my mom, and my brother were all at a picnic at the beach. This super old lady would walk up to us and she would take me. She then would lock me up in the room behind my dresser. 
This dream would reoccur every single night for months. It scared me so much that I started to not sleep at night. I developed insomnia and would only sleep for two to three hours per night at only eight years old. There was a couple nights where I swear I saw the old lady standing in the corner of my room. My parents just thought I was hallucinating from no sleep though. Stay tuned for part three. This is part three of my scary childhood story about the door behind my dresser. Because I wasn't sleeping and developed insomnia, my parents took me to a sleep therapist. The only thing the therapist gave me was a bunch of sleeping pills. Even though the sleeping pills worked, it made my dreams so much worse. I even started walking in my sleep. I would wake up all the time not in my bed. My covers would be all the way across the room like someone had dragged them over there. One night, one of my best friends slept over and we heard knocking coming from the door behind my dresser. That night when we went to bed, she started speaking really creepy gibberish in her sleep. I had to go get my mom to wake her up. I woke up a couple nights feeling like I was suffocating and when I swung out of bed, I saw a silhouette of an old lady. My cat even started to sit there and meow and hiss at random things in the corners of the room. But there was nothing ever there. It got so bad to the point where I moved up into my brother's room. If any of you have listened to all three parts and are experts on spirits, please message me on Instagram and tell me what you think I released that night when I opened the door.